Alright. So, today, guys, is a really long lesson. It is going to be all me talking and you listening. I apologize for that, but once in a while, that's what's got to happen. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to be going over all the stuff to do with the biomes. Okay, remember that last week we talked about the big thing that you're going to have to do with biomes. Well, there's two things. Two things you'll have to do with biomes on an exam. Okay, unit exam, final exam. One of them, I will give you a picture and a description of that biome in a multiple choice question. And you will have to identify the proper biome, which is really pretty easy. You can't go wrong. The pictures are usually pretty obvious. However, you still do need to read the description because there's one or two biomes that are close, okay? And sometimes the picture is a tiny bit misleading, okay? Like you see something in it and you're like, oh, that always goes with this. But sometimes it also goes with this biome. So always make sure you don't just look at the picture, also read the description. Between the two, it is so obvious, okay? Um, and the second thing that you're going to have to do is I give you a climatogram. And you have to tell me which biome that climatogram fits with. All right, so um, every one of the ones in here, okay, I don't think it's in your notes package, but everyone in here, I have a picture of the biome's climatogram, okay, as well, okay, as part of the description. So we can talk about those, and that'll be pretty easy, I think, for you when we get to that point. Okay, uh, so that's what you have to do. So here's where the biomes are located, okay? Map of the Earth here, where are the biomes located? So, tropical rainforest, okay, tropical rainforest, Huge, very tall, very old trees, okay, very lush conditions, uh, very hot, very humid, lots and lots of rain, okay, all that kind of stuff, okay, that is the kind of dark green areas. And you probably notice on here that there are no dark green areas outside of 30 degrees. In fact, there's basically none outside of 23 degrees, okay, on uh, north or south of the equator, all right, so. Tropical rainforests are an equatorial climate. Okay, they are very close to the equator, which means their climatograms are going to have a certain shape, which we'll talk about shortly. Okay, the savanna. Okay, the savanna is where you have like you know lions and tigers, but not bears. Giraffes. Okay, wildebeests. Or water buffalo. Okay, you know the uh, cheetahs and all that kind of stuff. Okay, the, basically the the African safari kind of places, all right? That's generally where we picture the savanna. There is savanna in other places. Um, it has similar weather conditions, but maybe not the same types of animals, all right? Um, but you do see a little bit here in South America, okay? Now, this stuff here in South America is not necessarily natural, okay? It's often the result of deforestation, okay? Things like that, because there's a lot of um, forestry going on, the tropical rainforest, okay? Uh, this is much more naturally occurring. The stuff through Africa here is much more naturally occurring, as well as this stuff here that's on the coastal parts of Australia. Well, not so much coastal, but, okay, just inland from the coast of Australia, okay? They have kind of a monsoonish season where it rains a lot and then it's dry for basically the rest of the year. All right, so they're also equatorial. You do not see them outside of 23 to 30 degrees, okay, uh, from the equator with the exception of this little strip, okay, right here. All right, um, desert. Now, there's different kinds of deserts, okay? We kind of lumped them all together, but there are different kinds of deserts, okay? There's, like, the desert that's in Arizona, Utah, Nevada, okay, which is a rocky desert, okay? Does it still get rain? Yes, just not very much, right? Um, what kind of things live there? Well, cacti and stuff like that. And then there's the kind of true desert, okay? So the Sahara, basically, if you were in, like, Tunisia, for example, okay, is the place where they film all the scenes for Tatooine in all of the Star Wars movies, okay? It's the rolling dunes of sand that we picture a desert as being, okay? That's, yeah, that's your typical desert, for sure. That's your hot desert, Okay, is it possible to have cold deserts? For sure, okay? The Gobi Desert up here is a cold desert, okay? It's a rain shadow desert from the Himalayan mountains, all right? So there's the Himalayas, there's the Gobi, right? It's, it's much more of a colder desert, and it snows there even, okay? Um, and it snows in Arizona as well, okay? Up in Flagstaff, they have ski hills and stuff, all right? So deserts can be cold, right? But the big thing is that they are dry, okay? That's the big thing that they have in common. Um, Okay, extreme desert, as if desert wasn't bad enough. Okay, there's extreme desert, which we see is just rock and ice. Now, you see little bands of that color where? 
on the tops of the major mountain ranges of the world. Okay, Ex essentially, an extreme desert is considered to be very dry because the liquid or the water that is there is not in a liquid form. Okay, what's the driest continent on Earth? How many of you right now are wanting to say Africa desperately bad? Okay, and that's what we most of us think, right? Because that's where the Sahara is. It should be Africa, except it's Antarctica. Okay, Antarctica not only gets the least amount of rainfall, okay, but any moisture that's there is frozen, okay, which makes it very, very dry. All right, so it's it's the driest continent, okay, because it's extreme desert, rock, and ice. So you see that it's on the tops of the major mountain ranges where glaciers and ice fields and things like that. I've been to the Columbia ice fields; they're part of that biome, okay. Tops of the Himalayas, okay. Uh, you have like you know around Mount Kim Kilimanjaro, okay, and places like that, kind of in here in Africa. All right, the uh, the Andes, okay, all those kind of things are all that, and of course. Uh, Antarctic, or sorry, Greenland, okay, is mostly glacier, okay, uh, and things like that. So generally, that's where you find it. Okay, obviously, Antarctica is not on this map. I don't know why. It's just not. Okay, but should it be all that color? Yes. Okay, uh, chaparral, which is often referred to as the Mediterranean climate. I can't imagine why. It's about the only place on earth where you find true chaparral. There's a little bit here in Southern California, okay, and a little bit here on the southeastern tip of Australia, okay. Um, typically, you've got hot, dry conditions, but you have, you know, sporadic rainfall enough to keep things growing, okay. So if you've ever been to the Mediterranean, you've been to Italy or Greece, okay, and places like that, okay, that's true Mediterranean climate. It can be very hot. Okay, uh, it can get cooler, right? But it's uh, it's not going to be like wintry cold, right? Uh, and you get very distinct types of plant life growing in a place like that. Okay, which we'll talk about in a little bit. All right, temperate grassland. We generally call that prairie or home because that's kind of where we live. Okay, so yes, there's big chunks of of temperate grassland through North America here. Okay. In, in all of the prairie provinces, so you know, so Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba, okay, and then you got Montana and you know, basically all the way over Wyoming, even even into Iowa a little bit there, okay, uh, and then you've got large tracts of it through Central Asia here, okay, so Mongolia would be you know like well in Asia they call it steppe, not prairie, but okay, it would be that kind of stuff in there, so that whole area, okay, in through here. And there's also sporadically deserts in there as well, but grasslands and deserts often border on each other because grasslands can be pretty dry. Okay? They get enough moisture usually through the winter to sustain them through the, the summer months. All right. Now, you see this? This we got a desert right here that we okay. It's kind of an odd one because there's water right there. Okay, so that's that's what the Caspian Sea, right? Something like that. I can't remember my geography so well. All right. Um, why would there be a desert right behind a big body of water? It's just the way the wind blows. Okay. Patterns of prevailing winds don't allow the moisture to move this way. They're making it move the other way. Just that's the way it works in that localized kind of area. Okay. So you do sometimes get uh, that kind of stuff. Because I mean, look at the Sahara. Here's the ocean. You'd think that should be kind of wet but it's not, okay, just kind of the way it goes. Okay, um, temperate deciduous forest. Deciduous means the trees do what? They lose their leaves, okay, so they're the ones that shed their leaves. So, obviously, most of the eastern seaboard of the United States and central Canada, okay, would be considered that. That's why the maple leaf's on our flag, okay? Maple trees are obviously deciduous trees, so that's a big chunk of it there. The majority of Europe at least at one point was temperate deciduous forest. A lot of that was taken care of in the Industrial Revolution to fuel factories and such, but okay, it would have naturally been that sort of biome. Um, and then we've got the taiga, which we, is coniferous forest. Conif coniferous trees have what kind of leaves? Needles. And they reproduce with cones, right? So coniferous trees have cones, okay? So pine trees, spruce trees, that kind of thing, okay, uh, are that stuff. And you can see that a lot of Canada, okay, is taiga, 
essentially once you get kind of north of Edmonton, you're into the Tega. If you're in Fort McMurray, you're in the Tega, okay, the coniferous forest there. Um, and that basically takes us almost all the way up. Okay, it's kind of hard to see on here, but there is a color change kind of right in through here. Okay, and if you get above that, you are into the tundra. Okay, the tundra is an Arctic prairie. It is very flat. Okay, and there is no trees. Are no trees. There are no trees. Okay, got to use plural together there. Okay, uh, so there are no trees. Tundra actually means treeless. Now, there's also tundra on the mountains. Okay, you get like taiga going up the mountainside. I mean, if we look at the mountains, right? We got you got trees, and then all of a sudden the trees end. Okay, well the the tree line is where the tundra, the alpine tundra starts. Okay, and it's similar up here. This would be Arctic tundra, and the tundra on the mountains is alpine tundra. But the conditions that produce it are the same: long, cold winters. Okay, and much drier conditions. Okay, um, you also generally get permafrost, which means the ground doesn't ever completely thaw. Okay, which makes it difficult for large trees to get root. Okay, so that you generally get treeless and uh, long winters, obviously, kind of conditions. Making sense? All right. Specifics for each kind of biome. Tropical rainforest. It is the chia pet of the world, okay? Anyone know what a chia pet is? I might have dated myself a little bit there, okay? You used to get these little clay heads and or animals and, and you'd put these seeds on them and then you'd pour water on them and they'd grow and they'd get this, this green stuff. You could make a chia fro on a guy, on a head, anyway. Okay, it just, the, the trees are everywhere is my point, okay? They'll grow on any surface, okay? All over the place, there's plant cover so thick that you can't walk through it in places, okay? You've probably seen in the movies or on TV, you know, and the guys are carrying the big machete and they're just swinging it in front of themselves, okay? You have to. It's the only way you can move forward. Well, you can move forward, but without the machete, you'll be lucky to find your way back. Because the jungle will literally close in behind you and you just lose your way. All right, the the ground is really mucky. You don't, you know, prints are often underwater, so you don't really see them. Okay, things like that. My dad and I made that mistake. We decided we'd go for a hike in the jungle when we were in Hawaii. Went into the jungle, you know, and just thinking like Canadians, you know, we go into the forest in Canada. You never worry about finding your way out because you can see through the trees. Uh, we spent a, a very stressful couple of hours because we got completely turned around. Okay? You can't see the sun because the, the overgrowth is so thick that you can't tell where it is. And so you really quickly lose your direction. Okay? We were just lucky enough we got close enough to a road that we could hear the road and just followed the sound back and ended up walking about four kilometers along the road okay, to get back to where we'd started. Um, so y it is a lot different type of forest than we're used to. It's just thick okay? and there's layers of it. Right? There's the layer that's on the ground, and then there's you know, these other kind of lower growth layers, and then they're, near the end you start getting like canopy layers. Like there can be like six layers to the forest, okay? and different types of trees grow in each layer. Okay, so the big thing is that your, um, you've got high temperature, high humidity, high rainfall. Okay, there's lots and lots of heat and moisture. The stuff that makes plants grow is there. Okay, um, so that do dominates the climate. Okay, precipitation exceeds evaporation. That means more water falls on the rainforest than can possibly dry up, which is going to lead to flooding. Okay, there are months and months of the year, consecutive months of the year, where the rainforest is simply underwater. Okay, the tall trees stick out. Okay, um, but essentially, like if you're in the Amazon, the Amazon River just swallows up. Okay, much of the tropical rainforest just because of all the flooding. Now, you can see here these are mountains. Okay, but what do you notice is different about these mountains from mountains in Canada? Yeah, they're covered. Okay, like even these this really steep spire here. Okay, has got growth all over it. Every surface, no matter how steep. Okay, has got plants growing on it because there's just that much moisture. Okay, it can grow on a surface where here water would run off of it and be gone and be dry all the time. Okay, but it rains so much that even steep sides of a mountain, okay, are going to be moist, and so they can support plant life. Okay, 
All right, so big things here. There's no distinct seasonality. We see that here on the temperature line okay, of the climatogram. Basically the same temperature all year long. We said that when you have a flat temperature line, you generally are looking at an equatorial climate. Okay, And we can see that rainfall is not only very high, 200 millimeters per month, okay, and that it is relatively consistent. Okay, their, their driest month is around 140 to 150 millimeters. That's 15 to 20 centimeters of rain in a month. We get that here, and it floods. Okay, it certainly does. Right, so that's a lot of a lot of moisture, and it's rainfall, not snowfall. Right, so we're we're talking about you know a very very wet kind of place. Okay, now the soils, when you can see them, okay, look kind of like this. Maybe I'll get Sadie to turn off that front set of lights. Okay, and they just look kind of bleached. Okay, I mean obviously they're not bleached, but okay, they look that way because the the minerals and stuff get sucked out of them by a process called leaching. Okay, when water sits on top of the soil, okay, the soil becomes saturated because it can't absorb any more moisture. Well, when that happens, it's like it's all one big mixture. So the minerals that were in the soil dissolve into the water, and then, because things like to move from where they're concentrated to where they're less concentrated, that means from the water in the soil to the water on the surface, the minerals leach out, they get sucked out of the soil by the floodwaters, and then they get carried away when the flood floodwaters run off. All right? So it actually makes for very nutrient-poor soil. Okay. Yet, we get these big lush forests growing in them. Well, that's because the trees and the plants can actually pull the minerals out of the flood water as opposed to out of the soil. Okay, So the soils are really poor, and that's a big problem because in the tropical rainforest, people are trying to scratch out a living. So they'll employ what's called slash and burn agriculture. Have you guys heard of that before? Okay, They just cut down the forest, set fire to it, Okay, and then kind of plow it all under and try and grow crops. Okay, it's not that these people don't know better. Okay, they they do, but it's all they have. It's the only way they can grow food and live. All right, so they they just they cut down the rainforest and they grow crops there. But the soil only lasts for about a year, maybe two seasons at the most, and then it's just completely devoid of nutrients. Okay, because it didn't have all that many to begin with, and so after they've grown crops there. They can't get anything to grow, so they go and cut down another section of forest and do the same thing, and that's what's leading to a lot of the deforestation. Okay, yeah, again, it's not that they don't know better; it's just that hey, they got to eat, okay? and that's the only way to grow food. So it's a big problem, obviously, having those nutrient-poor soils, and obviously having conditions where your crop could be flooded at any time. Okay, kind of without warning. So um, it's a it's a big deal for people who live there. Okay, decomposition is very rapid. It should be when you've got high temperatures and high moisture, okay? That's going to encourage things like mold and bacteria and the things that break stuff down to grow, okay, in large amounts. So that's the case there, okay? Um, intense weathering caused by rainfall causes the near total removal of soluble nutrients. Lots of stuff just gets washed away and eroded, okay? We talked about leaching here already. Uh, and since calcium and potassium are highly soluble in water, they tend to be very low in the soil. Okay? Is that making some sense? Right now, um, other things that are different here, rivers are a lot different in the tropical rainforest than they are here. Okay, you walk up to a river here and it's clear, unless it's like May or June, right? Okay, it, it's pretty clear then, and you you know you can go in, walk into it, you know swim in it, whatever, and you don't worry very much about stuff. But because there's such high temperature and high rainfall and whatever, the water there is a lot warmer. Okay, and that's going to mean that there's a lot more stuff in the water. Okay, and I don't mean like piranhas and stuff like that. I mean like bacteria and parasites and stuff like that that you don't necessarily have in clearer high mountain streams like we have. Okay, so um, you do have to be careful about being in the water there um, because you can get all kinds. If you get a cut and then you go into the water, you can get a, a bad enough infection that you can die. Okay, so you have to be pretty careful about those kind of things as well. Okay. So soil profile, I think I showed you this picture before, but okay, the soil profile for a tropical rainforest, there's practically no A horizon, which is the top soil, okay, because it gets washed away. It's loose, okay, and the floodwaters will wash it away. The B horizon is very large, 
right? That's where all the clay is, because clay doesn't wash away, but it also doesn't hold on to nutrients very well. Okay, so it's again nutrient poor soils, and then under there would be very highly weathered parent material. Okay. So give you an idea, some shots of the tropical rainforest here. This is what a lot of parts of the tropical rainforest look like at ground level. Okay. In Canadian forests, there isn't a lot of undergrowth, okay, because the temperature is going to be a lot lower and there's shade. I mean, there's still shade here. It's not sunny at, on the floor of the tropical rainforest, but it's warm, so plants can still grow, okay, whereas you don't see a lot of undergrowth in our forests. Um, but again, just really thick, and it's not one type of plant either. Okay. There's a whole bunch of different shapes of leaves in here because there are so many different kinds of plants. Okay. Um, and then these are the specialized anchoring roots. Okay. This is an area that was cleared, so the roots are just kind of exposed. Okay. These are the roots that anchor the plant to the ground so it doesn't wash away in the floodwaters and stuff, but they do very little in terms of absorbing nutrients for the plant. These up here are called snorkel roots they allow the plant to gain oxygen while its um, other roots are submerged. So this is what allows them to tolerate the flooded conditions. Now, there's no sense of scale here because I had to take this picture. I couldn't stand next to them. But if I had, at six feet tall, that's what it would have looked like. Okay, So these things are six to eight feet above the ground in order to make sure that at least some of that snorkel root that allows them to breathe is above the water. Okay. So it gives you some idea, right? I mean, floodwaters can wash away and strip all that stuff, okay, right down to the roots. That's why they have to have so many roots to keep them anchored when a lot of the soil washes away. Okay, so eight different layers of vegetation from the ground to the top of the canopy. The canopy is the top layer. Okay, so you got undergrowth, Okay, and then you've got kind of mid-layer growth, and then you've got sub-canopy, and then you have canopy layers okay, above that. So lots of different layers, very, very tall trees in the canopy part. Now, the other thing is the diversity. Okay? Diversity means how many different kinds of plants there are. In one hectare, which is approximately the area enclosed by our running track, so essentially the size of a football field, okay, is about a hectare. 100 meters by 100 meters. Okay, um, there could be up to a hundred different types of trees. Not a hundred trees, a hundred different kinds of trees. There could be thousands of trees in an area the size of the football field, and there could be up to a hundred different kinds of them. You go into a forest in Canada, and you go to Banff, and you're going to see five different kinds of trees. Okay, you'll see some balsam poplar, and you'll see, or sorry, you'll see some uh, some poplar, and then you'll see some fir, and then you'll see some Engelmann spruce, and some lodgepole pine, and maybe some black spruce. And that's it. Okay, I mean, you look at the side of a mountain, and all the trees look pretty much the same. There are a few different kinds, obviously, but they're all very similar. Okay, and nothing like this. Okay, lots of diversity. Okay, obviously the trees are evergreen, okay, but they're evergreen and lush, not evergreen like we picture evergreen, like coniferous trees, okay, they're evergreen, they never lose their leaves. If you lose your leaves in the tropical rainforest, it's because you're dead, okay, because if you lose your leaves, you will be, because everybody else will outgrow you, okay, in a matter of a month or so, okay, growth is very rapid. All right, the animals that live in the rainforest, not a lot of big animals in the rainforest. Because big animals have to live where? Open spaces where they can move around. In other words, on the ground. What is the ground covered by? Plants and water, right? The flooding makes it very difficult for large animals to find a place as habitat. Okay, So you don't see a lot of large uh, herbivores or large carnivores because there's not enough food for them. So your biggest thing in the tropical rainforest? Bugs. Okay? Most of your animals in the tropical rainforest are bugs, reptiles, and amphibians, things that can tolerate the flooded wet conditions. All right? So you got like your dung beetle, okay? The ones that like make balls of poop. That's why they're called dung beetles. Okay? You got your walking stick. Okay? Anyone ever seen one of those for real? 
They're very cool. They look like a stick. Like I had a, a TA in university. He was an entomologist, and he brought in every time we had a lab, he brought in a different bug that he had because he had all these bugs. And he brought in a walking stick one day, and he had it in a terrarium. And he's like, and this is my walking stick. And we're like, where? There's a bug in there? Yep. He reaches in and pulls out a stick. And like, that's a stick. No. He, and then we saw the legs. The legs just kind of attached to his finger and arms. And it just hung. It looked just like a net. He would blow on it and it would sway like a tree branch would sway. It, like, it was perfectly camouflaged, right? Which is important because there's birds around that would love to have that as a meal. Okay? And then, of course, you got your praying mantis. Okay? Right? Like, you've probably seen those before. They're the ones that have, they sit there like this and they kind of look like they're praying. And then when some unsuspecting bug comes near, they, <coughs> and they stab it and eat it. Right? Yeah. So they're kind of vicious. Okay? But lots and lots of bugs. Okay? Lots of amphibians, okay, frogs and things like that, you know, newts and salamanders and, and that kind of thing, okay, lots of different kinds, very brightly colored, okay, kind of bugs. Um, why the bright colors? Wouldn't it be smarter for amphibians to have camouflage as opposed to be brightly colored? Yep, exactly, and birds know it, okay. There's a thing in uh, behavioral psychology called taste aversion, okay. A bird might eat one brightly colored frog in its life but it'll get so sick that it'll never eat another one because it associates the bright colors with being violently ill, okay? And it'll never eat that thing again, okay? It's the same thing, the same uh, reaction you have to any yellow and black striped bug. Are there lots of yellow and black striped bugs that don't bite, and don't sting? But you once got stung or bit by a yellow and, yellow and black striped bug and you have that same reaction. Every time you see a yellow and black striped bug, you swat at it and run around like a crazy person. Okay, it's the same type of reaction. All right, um, small, cute, little mammals. Okay, there's not many of them, but there are some. They are, however, arboreal, which means they live in the trees. Okay, they may never set foot on the ground. All right, and then you got this guy. What's this? A three-toed sloth, the slowest mammal on earth. Okay, with a blinding top speed of about 30 centimeters per second. Okay, and that's if they're at a dead sprint. Okay, yeah. They don't really sprint. They kind of amble. All right. They, they are designed to hang in the trees, not run on the ground. Okay, their musculature is all designed to be in this position, to hang. Okay, and they've got, they've got toenails that are like coat hangers. Okay, and they just go right over top of the tree branches and they can just chill out and sleep like that. Okay. And so they, they, they kind of shuffle along on the tree branches and swing a little bit, kind of like orangutans a little, okay? But they basically never set foot on the ground because to be on the ground, you have to be oriented differently and you use different muscles to support your weight. Their muscles are all designed to support weight from a hanging position, okay? So they're definitely an arboreal animal. Now, lots of species in the tropical rainforest are what we call endemic, which means they only live in that one very specific spot in the tropical rainforest, which means they can be very easily eliminated, okay? They can be made to go extinct by a simple act of logging, okay, in a particular area because, you know, they only live in that spot in the whole world, okay? Um, and the same can be said for, for plants in the tropical rainforest, okay? There are some plants that only live in one place. Um, however, lots of the trees in the tropical rainforest are very desirable for um, hardwood, okay, for use on floors and stuff, because they have nice uh, patterns and stuff. They look, they look really, they are, and look really expensive, okay, uh, when you put them down for floor, okay? Uh, if anyone has, like, cabruva, okay, cabruva wood is one of those, and it's, it's a really, like, elegant-looking uh, type of, of board, okay, and when you put it down, it looks really nice, but it's actually uh, kind of endangered, okay? but people buy it anyway. My wife once built her, her house before we met. She had cabruva hardwood, and I came in, I'm like, is that cabruva? We almost didn't have a second date because I was like, oh, that's sad. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. All right, I'm not a tree hugger by any sense. Okay, um, chemical cycling. So how fast essentially nutrients, um, how much, how fast nutrients get cycled through the, uh, through the environment, okay? It's very fast because the two biggest factors for cycling anything are heat and moisture. Okay? If you've got those things, the organisms that tend to break things down can grow easily. All right? So again, things like fungus, uh, molds, uh, 
bacteria, right? Lots of insects. Insects are, are an important part of decomposing material. Okay, so stuff decomposes very rapidly, right? A tree falls in the forest, it makes a sound first, okay, and then it starts to decompose really, really quickly. Okay, and we're talking like in a matter of a few weeks to a month, a large tree can essentially be rotten. Okay, if it falls in the rainforest. Now, tree falls in the forest here, okay, and it can be sitting and rotting for 10 years, right? Because the process of its decomposition is interrupted every year for several months. Okay, um, yeah, that's basically what we need to know about that. All right, savanna. Okay, so in the savanna, okay, obviously. It's, a, it's kind of a tropical prairie, really. Okay, it's a tropical prairie. It gets a lot of rain, almost the same amount of rain as the rainforest does. But it gets it in a short span of time, and then it's dry after that. Okay, so we'll look at a climatogram here in a minute. Okay, but you can see wide expanses of essentially open prairie, but a lot different than prairie here. Okay, around here, even our long grass prairie is maybe about this long. Okay, uh, and then we got the short grass prairie that looks like it's had a buzz cut. Okay, it's very short and always burnt looking. Like if you go down to Medicine Hat, that's kind of short grass prairie. Okay, in the savanna, you've got very tall grasses. Okay, like elephant grass. All right, anyone ever heard of that stuff? I had a guy in my class last year, uh, and he he was from South Africa, and they had an acreage there, and he said, yeah, this is because people didn't believe me when I said it's called elephant grass because elephants can hide in it. And they're like, no, grass can't grow to be that tall. I was like, well, it's kind of like bamboo. It's almost like kind of like that. And he's like, and he finally pipes up and goes, yeah, we had it growing all around our place in South Africa. He said, literally, the elephants can sneak up on you because it's so tall. You don't see them coming. Now, you really aren't paying attention if you can't feel an elephant sneaking up on you because they're not real stealthy animals. But, okay. All right. Big thing with the uh, climate, okay? Look at the rainfall pattern here, right? This is what we call the monsoon season, okay? Huge storms, it rains for weeks, okay? And doesn't quit, just rains and rains and rains and rains. There's flooding that happens and all that kind of stuff. And then it just ends, and then it's dry. They get essentially no rain, okay, for months at a time. But look at the rainfall here. I mean, we thought 200 millimeters of rain was a big deal. Look at this, 350 in a month. Okay, that's 35 centimeters, and that that's you know that's an average. Okay, there are months where okay or years where they would have more than that in that particular month during a monsoon season. So it's a lot of rain, but then obviously it peters off pretty fast. What do you notice about the temperature though? Equatorial or not? Equatorial. Okay, it's flat. Okay, so we know anytime you see that you're looking at a at a biome that's only going to be near the equator. Okay. Um, so they have a distinct dry season, obviously, and some plants will estivate, okay, which means they go dormant, just like our plants do in the winter. Okay, they just go dormant for the for the dry season. Okay, um, fires are a big deal, wildfires, sometimes human induced and sometimes caused by dry lightning strikes and things like that. But during this dry season here, it can get like match dry, matchstick kind of dry. It's very, okay, and then you get one lightning strike and, and uh, you know, huge tracks of the savanna can burn. But a lot of the plants are fire resistant. Okay, the eucalyptus tree, for example, is fire resistant. If it burns, all the foliage will die, burn off, whatever, and it'll just grow new foliage. Okay, its bark is kind of insulated against the heat of a fire. Okay, and it can actually survive a fire and grow again. All right, so it's kind of evolved to be fire resistant. All right, what's, uh, so we got this like cheetah here sitting on top of this. What is this? Uh, termite mound. Yeah, close. Yeah, anthill. It's a termite mound. Okay. Termites are everywhere in the savanna. And they'll eat any plant material that they can get that, you know, essentially is dead enough or sick enough that it doesn't fight them back, okay? Because plants kind of have immune, kind of an immune response and how the sap clots and stuff like that. But um, that's essentially all termite poop, which is really sawdust. Because, I mean, what do they do but eat trees and plants and stuff like that? It's all plant material. So it's essentially like a big pile of stinky wet sawdust, 
right? Um, that's kind of what it is. And so it's a huge mound. So, so it's just like a big anthill because termites are col colony-type organisms like ants. Okay, so you'd have the queen and whatever on the inside laying the eggs and all the little drones and soldiers and whatever else everywhere else. Okay, so plants in the in the savanna have to produce tons and tons of seeds in order to survive, in order to have some of those seeds survive the amount of insects that are there, okay, that are eating all of the plant material, especially during the dry season when all the plants are dormant because then their foliage can't defend itself, right, and, it's, and it just gets eaten. All right. So vegetation, okay, like we said, trees are fire resistant. Um, you got tall grasses here, okay, so this is actually a picture of savanna that's, that was in uh, Hawaii. There are areas of like kind of scrubby brush, okay, like small trees and things like that. There are some of those. Uh, there are trees in the savanna, but not like thick like the rainforest, okay, and you can see here this is elephant grass. Okay? The kid gave me a picture of it. It's it very, very, very tall because you can see that it's, you know, the trees are not a whole lot taller than it is. Okay, so it's, yeah, quite tall stuff. Okay, many savanna trees are zero fights, okay. Zero fights are drought resistant, okay, types of, uh, of plants, okay. Um, we got uh, leaves obviously being shed during the dry season, so they do have some deciduous plants that lose their leaves not because winter's coming, but because the dry season is coming, okay. Lots of trees are stunted and can be overtopped by the tall grasses of the biome. <coughs> Imagine walking through the elephant grass and bumping into a tree, okay, because you didn't see it. All right, that's kind of weird, but it can happen. All right, African elephant grass can reach heights of several meters, okay. Uh, and is the most common. Okay, other long grasses and some short grasses will inhabit the drier areas. Okay, in the in the savanna, the soils, the horizons are not as distinct because there's so much topsoil. Okay, because every year you've got all that grass that dies and the the blades decompose and the the termites eat them and whatever, and so you always get this thick mat of organic material. Okay, um, you do get some water erosion during the monsoon season channels of you know of uh, floodwaters will cut you know a big it'll cut a big channel out okay and erode a lot of water things like that okay all right animal diversity not like the tropical rainforest okay it's much less diverse yes there's lots of bugs okay but you don't see as many of the amphibians and lizards. You see some reptiles, snakes, okay, but uh, not nearly like the tropical rainforest. And the food chains are really, really short. In the tropical rainforest, the, the food chains are incredibly long, okay? They can be 20, 25 organisms long because it's this bug eats that plant, and this bug eats that bug, and this bug eats that bug, and this bug eats that bug, and so on. There's lots of bug eat bug. And then there's like amphibian eats bug, and then bird eats amphibian kind of near the top. Your top predators in the rainforest are the biggest bugs, birds, okay? Most of the animals, the big kind of mammals in the tropical rainforest are herbivores, okay? Not carnivores. Not the case in the in the savanna. In the savanna, the animals are all big. The herbivores are big, and then by necessity, the carnivores have to be big, all right? I mean, you're not going to see, you know, uh, let's say something small like a a fox taking down a wildebeest, a zebra, or a giraffe, okay? You have to be somewhat large to take down large prey, okay? But what I mean by the food chains being short is this. That animal ate the plants, and then that animal eats it, and that's the end of the food chain because the lion's kind of the top of the food chain, all right? So it's a very short food chain. It's producer, primary consumer, tertiary consumer, done, okay? And it only has three levels because the animals start out really big. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. All right. Um, some of the trees in the savanna. Okay. The trees in the savanna, a lot of them have this umbrella shape. The advantage to this umbrella shape is that it shades the roots, just like an umbrella. Okay. And that means that the soil around the roots can s keep moisture for longer because it's not under direct sunlight and evaporating more quickly. Okay. So this is kind of how it's a twofold twofold reason to have this shape. First off, no short animals can eat you. 
That's why giraffes evolved the long neck. Okay, but most of the animals are eating the grass, not the foliage from this tree. And secondly, it shades the roots. Okay, so it kind of serves protection in a few fashions. This is what it can look like after the monsoon season. Okay, so you can see kind of the floodwaters and channels that get cut as a result of all of that rain. Okay, so it can be very flooded. All right, chemical cycling is going to be pretty rapid. Okay, again, high temperatures and there's a reasonable amount of moisture as well. All right, in the desert. Okay, this is your kind of more typical North American desert. All right, it's uh, it's more rocky, okay, as opposed to sandy like in Africa. All right, so rocky desert. Um, we can have seasonality in these deserts. Okay, nor uh, des some deserts have seasonality, so they have a winter and a summer. Okay, um, and they have what they call their rainy season. Okay, my gr my grandfather lives in Arizona. And, you know, he sometimes talks, oh yeah, it's the rainy season right now. I'm like, oh, so how much did it rain? Uh, yeah, the ground was wet when I came out, and then an hour later it was dry again. Okay, so it, I mean, they don't get, it's not like it pours rain, okay, but they do on occasion get like freak rainstorms where it'll, it'll just pour, okay, because so, if you, how many people have been to Arizona, okay, you drive on the roads and you drive across these bridges and you're like, why is there a bridge here? Like there's nothing, there's no bridge to go over a river, okay, and if you look cl more closely, you see this dry channel, Okay, that it's over. Once every few years, there's enough rain that it's worth building that bridge to prevent having to rebuild the road. Okay, because the road would get washed out. Just, I mean, you guys remember what it looked like when the roads got washed out here in 2013? Okay, well, once in a while, they get enough rain that it'll just wash the road out. Okay, in that one spot, but it doesn't happen often. Okay. All right, um, what do you notice for vegetation? Very little, right? And that's typical. It's not going to be, you know, covered in green or anything like that. The desert can be very colorful at certain times of the year, okay, where the few plants that grow there are blossoming and things like that. So you're going to have mostly cacti and some really hardy grasses and maybe some kind of scrubby plants, okay, that kind of stuff, but not a lot. Okay, uh, big thing, dry. Obviously, that's the thing they all have in common. Okay. This here, kind of an idea. You got a bit of a flood channel right, right in through the middle of this picture, okay, and you can see the saguaro cactus, okay, growing here on the sides. Okay, the saguaro cactus is the one that's on the taco time sign. Right, it's got the arms. Anyone know how old one of those has got to be before it grows an arm? They're usually a hundred years old, 80 to 100 years old before they grow their first arm. So if you see a cactus that has lots of arms, it's very old. Okay, very very old. Okay. Looking at a hot desert, okay, we're starting to see a little bit of a bell curve coming in here. Not much, okay, but it's certainly not perfectly flat either, okay. There can be variations in temperature from 24 to, you know, 34 degrees, so a 10 degree temperature change. So you do notice some change in temperature for a desert, okay, but the big thing is this. There are many months where there is zero precipitation, all right. Their wettest month, 8 millimeters of rain, less than a centimeter, okay, in their wettest month, right, so obviously that's the big thing, is dry, okay, lots of different things can cause a desert, you can have your rain shadow deserts, okay, you can have like the Sahara, okay, um, where it's just, it happens to be always cold air blowing off the ocean, so it doesn't hold a lot of moisture, okay, or it could just be that you're in the middle of a very large land mass, and moisture simply doesn't get all the way in, and that's actually what happens on the continent of Australia, okay, the outback, the middle of Australia is very desert-like, because moisture just doesn't make it in from the coastlines. Okay, again, just kind of, that's, that's pretty lush desert. I used the word lush kind of facetiously there, but, okay, you can see there's quite a bit of plant life in that picture, okay, not everywhere, obviously, it's not a uniform coverage, okay, but there's still quite a bit more plant life than you might imagine, okay, and again, more saguaro cactus and things like that. Now, saguaro cactus are usually fairly widely spaced, they don't grow, like, usually right next to each other, reason for that, competition for moisture. They have, I think we talked about this in the bio unit, but they have the really shallow roots, okay? They're right at the surface, but they can spread out like 50 to 100 meters, okay, from the actual plant, right? So there's a lot of competition there for moisture, okay? 
Um, mesquite, okay, mesquite bushes can have uh, roots that reach depths of 50 meters. Okay, they can drive down even through the parent material in through the rock and tap aquifers and wells and things like that in order to get moisture. Okay, um, soils. There's again practically no a horizon. Okay, if you don't have a lot of plants growing there, you don't get a lot of organic material building up, so you don't build very much soil. And since it's always dry, if a wind comes up, it blows it away. All right, so it just doesn't get a chance to really build very much. So you got B horizon usually, and oddly enough, the parent material is usually pretty weathered. So that's why a, a mesquite bush can get its roots down through. It's not a solid layer of bedrock. It's more of a gravelly uh, kind of a layer, right, where the parent material is very broken. Hey, animals in the desert. Not very many big ones. Obviously, there are exceptions. Okay, you got your uh, camels, okay, that live in the desert. Um, but the problem with being a big animal in the desert is surface area, okay, and volume. You have to, you have a large surface area that you have to keep cool. Unfortunately, that large surface area also absorbs a lot of heat. Okay, and so it's a it's a tough time for animals to survive that that uh, that heat. So a lot of them are not big. Okay, a lot of them are very small. A lot of them live underground, and a lot of them are nocturnal. Okay, they only come out at night. Now, other animals, I mean, and, and a, a rabbit would be a large animal, okay, living in the desert. Uh, they have ways of cooling themselves that don't use moisture, okay? For us, being in the desert is bad, right? Because how do we cool ourselves? We sweat, okay? Sweating is a great way to cool your body, but it is not efficient in terms of use of moisture, okay? We don't last in the desert because we sweat out all of our moisture, and so that's not good. Rabbits don't sweat, okay? Oh, well. They don't sweat like we do. Um, what they do is, you can actually see in that picture the blood vessels in the ear. Okay, and uh, in the same way that when you blush, okay, how do you, how does your face feel when you blush? Yeah, it feels hot, right? Because the reason you blush is the capillaries that are near the surface of your skin engorge with blood. Okay, that's how your body cools itself. If you work out, you also get flushed. Okay, and then when you sweat, the sweat is against all that blood, and the capillaries are really small, so you got good surface area, okay, exposed to the cooling sweat, okay, and so you can cool off really quickly. Well, if you don't want to sweat, okay, you just have these kind of blood vessels, and then you can move, they can flap their ears a little bit, okay, and they can create some cooling effect there, and they can radiate some heat away. Um, the, the hump on a camel kind of serves that same purpose. Um, the hump on a camel, it's not filled with water, by the way. People have this idea that it's like a bucket of water. It's not. It does have a lot of moisture in it, but it's more like scar tissue. It's more like that kind of hard um, kind of sensation. And it, there's a lot of blood vessels that go into it. And the blood vessels flow past each other. So you have um, blood vessels coming in that are carrying hot blood. And you've got other blood vessels flowing by that are a little bit cooler. And so the, um, sorry, other way around. Um, you've got blood that's come from the, that's in the hump that's, that's hot, and it's going past blood that's coming into the hump that's a little bit cooler. So the blood that goes back to the body is going to cool off because it's coming past cooler blood. Okay? And so it's kind of, a, it's what's called a countercurrent exchange. Okay? And essentially the water within the scar tissue in the hump helps to absorb a lot of heat but not changes temperature very much. So the hump almost runs a fever while the rest of the animal stays a little cooler. Okay, kind of works something like that. So if I remember my metabolism course properly. Okay. Um, but most of the time animals in the desert are not out in the heat of the day. Certainly not mammals. Okay, and if they are they gotta stay in the shade, okay, things like that, because it's just not effective for them to be out at that time. However, snakes Snakes are generally okay. They like to come out in the sun. Okay, um, you have to watch for them actually, because they'll come out and sun themselves in the morning in order to warm up. Okay, anyone ever seen a rattlesnake? Okay. Like I used to live in southern Alberta when I was a kid, and we actually kept a flat, flat shovel on the doorstep, because they would come out from underneath our house and uh, they would sun themselves on the sidewalk. And so you'd come out to go to the school in the morning, and there'd be one sitting there on the sidewalk. Okay, and they're kind of nasty. So you have to kill them. You're not supposed to because they're endangered, but when it's you or them, it's kind of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Incidentally, you got to be careful with a rattlesnake, okay? If you ever hit them with a stick, they can come up a stick fast. Okay? They just like coil up around the stick really, really quick. That's why you use a flat shovel. You, you smoke them on the head with the flat part, and then they kind of spread out because they're dazed and they can... If you ever have to, that's how you do it. Okay? And never go into the grass in the prairie when they're molting. Okay, you ever snakes and molt, right? They they shed their scales. Um, they they're really aggressive when they're like that because the skin comes up over their head and they can't see and they don't sense heat as well and so they just strike at everything. Uh, so generally, you wear hip waders if you have to go in into any longer grasses because that they won't bite you through the hip wader. Uh, little tips for you. I think you guys are living a sheltered life and you have none of these experiences. Okay. Um, so, your top carnivores in the desert, maybe a fox, hawks, certainly birds do pretty well in the desert, especially since there's not a lot of cover for their prey. So, you know, a gopher or something comes out, they're easy prey, the hawk can get them. Okay, you got lots of bugs, scorpions and tarantulas, very heat tolerant bugs, not kind of moisture uh, related kind of bugs. Okay, another shot, different kind of desert. This is more of an equatorial hot desert, okay, but still similar kinds of things, not a lot of vegetation. Okay. Chemical cycling is very, very slow. No moisture, not a lot of bacteria because there's no moisture, not a lot of mold and fungus because there's no moisture, not a lot of soil bacteria because there's not a lot of soil. Okay, so if something dies in the desert, it takes a very long time for it to decompose. In fact, most of the time it just desiccates and then the, the dried husk just kind of sits there. All right, grasslands. Does that look very grasslandish? No, in fact, what is there in there? I see cacti in there. Okay. There's a cactus right there. There's cactus. In fact, there's a whole bunch of cactus. Okay. Each one of these circles is showing essentially a cactus. There's a whole bunch of them in here. Okay. The prickly pear cactus. Okay. Lives around here, actually. If you go down by Lethbridge and places like that, there's lots of prickly pear cactus. Because um, temperate grasslands often border on deserts. Okay? Temperate grasslands are dry. Okay? If you go to Medicine Hat and places like that, you go into Saskatchewan, okay, Regina, Moose Jaw, places like that, it's it's very dry. All right, especially through the summer. Yes, they get moisture in the winter, they get moisture in the spring, but then it basically doesn't rain again, okay, for the rest of the summer. Um, and so that creates situations where you can't get lots of big trees, you can't even get lots of tall grasses. So you have short grass prairie, which is what this is. Okay? And in short grass prairie you'll often get prickly pear cactus growing. Now, what kind of animals can live here? Okay. Can deer live there? Yeah, not as many. Um, you often see more antelope. Okay. You guys seen an antelope before? Okay. Um, antelope may never drink water. Okay, Because there just often isn't any. Um, but they can eat cactus. Uh, the inside of an antelope's mouth is like shoe leather. Okay, it's very hard. Even their tongue is very hard. So they can chomp right down on a prickly pear and break the the uh, thorns off. Okay, and they don't get stuck in their mouth. If you or I were to try that, <laughs> we'd be in the hospital. Okay, you often you'll often see like uh, uh, people's pets that have had an encounter with a cactus, and it's it's because the thorns they're not just sharp, but they're also hooked. They're like an embroidery needle. Okay, so they go in and then they can't, you can't get them out, right? And, or you break them off and that's worse and you get an infection and stuff. So they're, they're designed to keep from being eaten, but there are some animals that can actually eat them. Okay, um, the grasses, obviously, they're okay as long as they're growing, but you don't see many you know, animals eating them after they're dead because okay? there's not a lot of moisture in them. Now, the big thing for this biome is this biome feeds a lot of people. Okay, that's where we do a lot of our farming. Agriculture is a big industry in Alberta. There's oil and then there's agriculture. Okay, and it used to be the other way, but now it's oil first. All right. So, yeah, it's a big deal. There's a lot of agriculture there because most of our plants, our food crops, are modified grasses or types or relatives of grasses. Okay, and so they grow in the places where grasses typically grow. All right, climatogram of Calgary, Alberta, prime prairie city. Temperature line is a 
is a bell curve. Okay, it's warm in the in the summer months, summer for us. Okay, June, July, August, cold in the winter months, and our temperature does, or sorry, our precipitation tends to follow our temperature. We get more precipitation in the summer months. Okay, and June, of course, is always our wettest month. All right. Now this here, guys, this picture here is short grass prairie. This is taken near Empress, which is about 40 minutes north of Medicine Hat. All right. So very short grass prairie, very stubble-like, okay, appearance, and obviously very flat. Okay. This is the uh, South Saskatchewan uh, River Valley here. Okay. No, it's not a mountain range. It's a, just the side, the other side of the river valley. Okay. So comparison: short grass prairie. Long grass prairie. Okay, so this long grass prairie is more like St. Paul, so much further north. Okay, where it's cooler. Okay, the summer isn't as hot, and the precipitation is a little bit more regular. Okay, so you get different types of grasses growing there than you do down here. Okay, in here you get like uh, grama grass, spear grass, okay, and things like that that are very drought tolerant but aren't very tall. Okay, whereas here you're going to get more oak grass, creeping red fescue, okay, um, crested wheat grass, and things like that that are taller and greener. All right, uh, soils, thick A horizon. B horizon and C horizon are much smaller, okay? And again, this means very fertile. That's why we use it for agriculture. All right, the animals. Why aren't there any animals in that picture? Because the native animals that used to live on the prairie are gone, okay? The biggest animal, they used to be in the biggest numbers that inhabited the prairie, was buffalo. Well, we took care of that. Okay? Brought in horses and rifles. They didn't stand a chance. Okay? Because they're big and dumb. Okay? I mean, how did the natives used to hunt them? Nope. You can't, you, you could shoot a buffalo with about a hundred arrows and it would basically just scratch. Okay? They drive them off a cliff. Okay? Because before before the you know the Europeans came over, they didn't they they had you know spears and bows and arrows and stuff, but they're not good enough for taking down something big like that. So what they would do is kind of spook the herd so that they would get running. Now it was dangerous for for the native people to hunt buffalo that way was very dangerous because the herd could just turn, and if the herd turns on you, they're going to trample you to death, and there's no getting out of the way because when a buffalo gets moving, they can go very fast. They don't accelerate very fast, but their top speed is good. Okay. The thing is, when a buffalo gets running, their head goes down like this, and their eyes are off to the side. If you ever looked at a buffalo, their eyes are on the side, right? But there's a reason for that. That way they can see predators coming while they eat, right? Their nose is down and it's eating, but they can see stuff coming. And it gives them a field of view that's pretty good, except for one spot right in front. Okay, They can't see there. So if you can get them running head down, you can run them off a cliff. And that's exactly what they would do. They would dress in like wolf skins and stuff like that and kind of pop up and, and spook them and get them running. And then they would just run them off of a cliff. Okay? Which is, I mean, that'll kill a buffalo. Okay? You've got a big enough cliff, like head smashed in buffalo jump. You guys been, been there? Okay, that's kind of a big, you know, Albertan history kind of place. Okay? But there aren't buffalo on the prairie anymore. Okay? You know, buffalo are big and strong, but they're not very smart. And barbed wire fences really bother them. And they, they don't, Unless they're spooked, they don't generally run through them. And because they're a migratory animal, it killed them. Because they would eat all the grass in the spot and then sit there and starve. Because they didn't know what to do. Normally they just move. Okay, Hundreds of thousands in a pack. Or in a herd, sorry, not a pack, a herd. Okay, And they would just move along. It was like someone ran a big giant lawnmower up the province as they would just walk through the prairie eating everything. Okay. But they're gone because they're a migratory animal and we've eliminated their ability to migrate. And we've replaced them with cows. Cows are far easier to deal with than buffalo are. Okay? Buffalo can be very mean and aggressive. Cows are big and stupid. Okay? You ever look a cow in the eye? There's just nothing there. Okay? We're doing a favor by eating them. Saves them from looking at their reflection in the trough every morning. Okay? Sorry, if you're a vegan, I apologize. I don't mean to insult you, but hey, okay? I like steak. Big steak. 
Buffalo steak is even better. But okay, um, it is actually. But um, yeah, you just we've replaced them with stuff that's easier to manage. Okay. Um, the other thing is, once we eliminated them, we eliminated their predators because there's nothing for their predators to eat, and obviously we don't want wolves and bears coming in and eating our our farm animals. Okay, same with coyotes and foxes and things like that. They've all been essentially eliminated simply because we've eliminated their food sources or we've directly eliminated them. Okay, wolves are essentially gone from the prairies. Black bears and grizzly bears are also essentially gone from the prairies. They've been what we call extirpated, which means removed from their native habitat and they've gone somewhere else. They've gone into the mountains instead. Okay, uh, now we did have we did have the bear who showed up here last year. Okay, in the river valley, uh, we've had cougars in town. Okay, moose in town, things like that. They just come through the river valley, right? But generally, they used to be everywhere. All right, so that's why there's no pictures of animals in the animal picture. Okay, chemical cycling is, you know, it's more rapid than the desert, but because there's a winter that stops it, it's, you know, not as fast as a tropical area. Okay, there's also the added nutrient load produced by these types of organisms, okay, and that can actually cause problems in in uh, standing water, okay. Uh, a bunch of lakes last summer had the problem with the big algae blooms, and people couldn't fish or swim or use the water in any way because there's so much toxic algae. Okay, you, you get that when a lot of nit nitrogen and stuff like that gets into the into the water and is allowed to sit there. Okay, so it can be kind of a problem that way. Oh man, I'm gonna really have to speed up here. Okay. Temperate, deciduous, broadleaf, evergreen, sclerophyllous, forest biomes. Deciduous. Okay, that's the kind that lose their leaves. Okay, there's lots of different names for them. All right, so you see here, generally the big kind of leafy fronds. All right, but they get lot, they lose them every single year. Okay, kind of important for logging and industry and things like that. Okay, now here's the thing: you're going to have the bell curve on the climatogram for these, but. You're not having the bell curve shape for the precipitation. The precipitation is relatively uniform. And that's the only way you're going to get a forest is with a steady input of moisture. All right, so we can see here that, yes, there's that definite summer and winter, okay? But our precipitation generally stays between 40 and 60. I mean, there's one month there, Ju July, where it's really wet, but generally fairly steady and moderate precipitation, okay, as opposed to ours, which would be low. Okay, uh, temperate forests are generally dominated by oak, beech, and hickory, okay, with smaller quantities of uh, birch, hazel, sycamore, and maple, depending on where you are and how cold it is. Okay, um, sclerophyllous forests found in the Mediterranean, this would be your, um, I've combined the deciduous with the um, chaparral, okay, kind of put them all in one here. In the Mediterranean, you have more drought tolerant species like olive, okay. Uh, Sessile oak. I don't know why they describe oak as sessile. I thought all oak was sessile, but apparently some of them are ants and can move around. I don't know. Sessile means they stay put. But okay, um, pine. Okay, things like that. Okay, tropical. Like tropical forests, there is a layering, but not like eight layers, like three layers. Okay, so you got your undergrowth, and then your understory, and then your canopy. Okay, kind of up top in the in the deciduous forest. Okay, uh, the soils generally have a pretty good A horizon because every year the trees lose their leaves and the leaves provide an organic mat that decomposes and makes good topsoil. Okay, B horizon is reasonable, okay, about the same thickness as the A horizon. The C horizon is going to be very well uh, broken up. It's not going to be like bedrock so much as more of the gravelly kind of layer like we had in the desert because there's lots of moisture there, freeze and thaw, which causes it to break up. Okay, the animals there, similar animals to the prairie, except you are going to get a few more uh, of the uh, kind of rodents and things like that because there's more cover. There's also some arboreal species like squirrels, okay, and things like that. Uh, a few more birds, okay. Um, you do have some birds that are not the top predators, okay, in this biome, okay. In most biomes, when you have a big bird, it's a top predator, okay. But these birds could be eaten by owls, okay, or foxes if they can catch them, okay, things like that. Okay, but it's almost like there's two separate food chains. There's the short food chain where you got big herbivores and big predators, and then you got the smaller food chains with the, you know the rodents and the we weasels and foxes and stuff like that. Okay, chemical cycling is more rapid than it is on the prairies because it's more temperate. 
here. Okay, it's it's uh, there's more moisture and the winters aren't as bad. Okay, so things tend to cycle a bit better. All right, for the Tega. Okay, here's your typical shot of Banff. Okay, Banff, Kananaskis, wherever. Okay, you got that carpet of trees, and they're all the same. All right, so there's not a lot of diversity. There's a lot of plant life, but there's not a lot of diversity. Okay, uh, and it's typically cold. Okay, some of the coldest temperatures on Earth are recorded in the Tega. Okay, yes, it's always cold in the Arctic, but once in a while it gets really cold in the Tega. It just doesn't stay that way. But we can get temperatures that are even colder than places that are in the Arctic circles. Okay, for short periods in those kind of places. All right, so looking at a climatogram for that, obviously a very steep bell curve that is very low, okay, on the temperature scale. We're okay, looking at our warmest months, okay, being around 15 degrees, and precipitation, okay, is still bell curved but low, okay, surprisingly low for the amount of trees that grow there. A lot of the water that comes to them is from meltwater, okay, so the, the snowpack melting in the springtime. All right. Um, okay, vegetation, like we said, there's not a lot of diversity. If you look in this picture here, okay, you can basically see lodgepole pine on this side and black spruce on the other. Okay, so there's just not a lot of diversity. Some grass and little kind of shrubs growing where there's open patches. Okay, soils, a horizon thinner, okay, because it's younger. Usually these areas, because they have all the freezing and thawing, they don't get a chance to build up as much organic material, so you get a small topsoil. All right, animals that live there, they have to do one of two things, hibernate or go away. Okay, so typically you got animals that are either really tolerant of the winter, okay, or they hibernate or go away. Okay, so um, your geese and birds and stuff like that that can migrate will do so. Okay, your larger herbivores will simply tolerate the winter and your small rodents will hibernate. Okay, squirrels and gophers, they'll just curl up in a ball. Their body temperature drops to like barely above freezing. Their heart beats once a minute. They breathe once every five minutes. Okay, and once in a while they wake up, shiver for an hour, eat some food, and go back to sleep. Okay, that's kind of how they tolerate the winter. All right, big thing for them, the insulative value of snow. Okay, those air pockets in the snow that trap all the air, okay, keep them safe from all the cold weather. All right, but if we pack that down, Okay, you ride your snowmobile over it, okay, it forces all the air out. And then that snow will not insulate. Okay, and any animal that was trying to live under it will have to find somewhere else to tunnel. Okay, because we'll compact the snow and it won't be as good an insulator. Okay, and there's lots of good sized predators in the Tega. Grizzly bears, black bears, okay, um, and then that guy, which would be a, that's a wolverine, okay. If you've ever encountered a wolverine, you were probably lucky to tell about it. Okay? Imagine all the ferocity and aggressiveness of a grizzly bear packed into something the size of a German shepherd. Okay? Yeah, they're crazy. Okay? Very aggressive. Good predators, though. They can catch lots of things because they're smaller. All right. Uh, chemical cycling is pretty slow because, again, winter lasts for th two-thirds of the year. Okay? So it doesn't give things a lot of time to decompose. All right, the Tega, okay, the Tega is, again, treeless. This is a picture of alpine, oh, sorry, this is tundra, sorry. This is a picture of alpine tundra, okay, date on here, okay. This is the 6th of July, 2002, but it's the 6th of July, okay. Uh, and what do you see here? Snow, okay. It's July, and there's still snow. So the, the ground never thaws more than about this deep, okay, and the plants have to grow really, really fast, Okay. Luckily, in the Arctic, when they have to grow really fast, it's also light 24 hours a day. Okay. So they kind of pack a lot of growing and stuff into a very short space of time. Okay. Um, climatogram for that. Okay. Same idea. It's very similar to the Tega. You got a very steep bell curve that's very low on the temperature. Okay. Warmest month is cooler than 10 degrees. Okay. And your precipitation. Okay. Is 60 millimeters in one month in their wettest month, and then obviously a lot of that is snow. Okay, a lot of that is snow. All right, and again, here another picture. This is in July as well. Still big amounts of snowpack, okay, sitting around. Um, but the snow is important because it protects the plants from the abrasive effects of ice crystals and stuff going across them, okay, and things like that. Okay, good. We'll leave it there. Whew, got done. All right, so tomorrow 
We'll do our full unit exam review in period four. Okay, don't forget that the periods are switched. Okay, also remember guys, when's your final exam? Okay, yeah, January 21st. Okay, nine o'clock in the gym. Your unit exam is Wednesday. Okay, so make sure you're studying tonight. And then tomorrow you'll have lots of questions to ask when we do our official review.